great God and King on this beautiful Sunday morning. Just a few announcements um, to make. May will be a very busy month. Uh, we've got a number of folks traveling today, but we will be busy in May here at the church with a prayer walk on Saturday morning, uh, May 18th, and then um, we'll have Synod coming up. Uh, in June for uh, Elder Kofer and I will be going to that. And so there's a lot uh, going on in the next couple of months as we gear up for summer. Uh, also, just a reminder, as I seem to want to do each week, is that is to remind you of our 150th anniversary celebration in October and our trip to Mon Clark in in, uh, in March, you'll be hearing more about that as uh, we get a little closer, but put that uh, time on your calendar. We will not have any worship here that Sunday morning. We'll be worshiping together in Bond Clark and uh, up in Hendersonville, North Carolina. I think that's all the uh, announcements uh, for us today. We will observe communion next week. So just be preparing yourselves this week for coming before the Lord's, uh, the Lord's table. Good morning, church. Uh, as we come together to worship God this morning, uh, I want to share some thoughts from uh, N.T. Wright, uh, a British uh, scholar and author uh, and, uh, and a critic of how the church uses scripture in worship so the concentration is what is the proper use of scripture during wor uh, worship and dr wright says from his numerous uh, observations of worship services that the present day church uh, is making an, a quote impoverished use of god's word wright says that as he's gotten older his appreciation has grown for how the biblical narrative is not just a random selection of writings haphazardly sandwiched together. On the contrary, he sees the scripture as a tightly woven tapestry with thousands of interconnected threads that tell one long, consistent, consecutive, big story. From Genesis garden to Revelation's garden the pieces form a deliberate and comprehensible account of God working out his salvation history in accord with his purposes. But Wright criticizes modern preachers and teachers for missing this massively important point. He, claim, he complains that the typical contemporary preacher strategically chooses biblical snippets, snippets a parable here, uh, a scene of Jesus performing social work, uh, or a poetic passage stressing God's infinite mercy and love. These fragments, these bits and pieces, are selected mainly to back up a point that the preacher has already decided that he wants to make. So I decided to mentally check out Tom Wright's objection based on my own biblical education. When I joined this church, the LARP church, I was in my 60s. So my, uh, uh, my Christian education had had ample time to grow. What I knew about the, about the Bible, however, was bits and pieces. The 23rd Psalm, John 3.16, Romans 8.28, the flood, Adam and Eve's fatal era, the passages in Isaiah uh, discussing Jesus as the suffering servant, and the Gospels. That's what I knew. That's what I knew. But did I grasp how these scriptural fragments were linked together, and why? Not on your life. Wright's argument is that right worship must focus on the big plan, the overarching narrative that shows God acting in history to save his people. That's where the glory of God is revealed. 
That's where the worshiper's eyes open up with tears in response to God's love and the, and the worshiper's heart bursts forth with repentant adoration. Now, doubtless, we're an imperfect church. Please hear me clearly on this point. But despite our flaws, we can rejoice that there is no way we can be accused of the bits and pieces era identified by Tom Wright. Come to Sunday school, come to this worship service, come to Sunday evening Bible study, attend the men's Bible study, and what will you find? The same thing, the big story being proclaimed. You'll find our covenant brothers and sisters wrestling to discern how the bits and pieces interlock with one another to proclaim the greatest news you can imagine, that while we were still sinners, God himself, whom we had sinned against, was miraculously figuring out a way to save us. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Dear Holy Father, when we think of what you've done with the gift of Scripture's comprehensive narrative, we confess that we tremble in the presence of such profundity. When we read the Word, we know you have tabernacled among us. The beauty of the story, the sheer beauty of the story, is our pillar of fire, our pillar of cloud, assuring us that you are there and you're leading us forward. This morning, saturate us with a story and remind us of the hope of the new creation to which the story points. We praise these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. If you will stand with me this morning and turn to page 87, uh, the song, Ferris Lord Jesus. Stand with me, please.
stand and pray with me. Father God, as we come this day into your house, as we've come to, as has been said, proclaim the meta narrative of Scripture, the big picture of your your plan of salvation from one garden to the next. Father, we ask now that you would hear us as we confess our sins. Father, each of us has fallen short. None of us are worthy of the salvation that you give and grant so graciously to us. Father, clothe us in your mercy and grace, for we ask it. And Father, We would pray that as we draw closer to you through worship, that your kindly light would shine brighter into the depths and resources of our hearts and of our minds to root out those stubborn areas of sin so that we might um, become more and more in the image of your gracious Son. And so, Lord, lead us as we confess our sins Hear each of us in our moment of silence as one and as each one confesses before you. Lord, each of us have done things that we shouldn't do, and each of us have left undone things that we should do. But Father, we plead those sins before the very throne of God, for in the blood of Christ we are washed clean. You separate us from our sins as far as the east is from the west, choosing to remember them no more. And so for that, O Lord, we praise you and we thank you, for it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Glory be to the Father. Thank you. up in the back of your hymnals to the Apostles' Creed, that creed that binds us together with Christians from the very beginning until the Lord returns. Good Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe believe in God, God, the Father Father Almighty, Almighty, maker maker of of heaven and earth, and and in Jesus Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Be seated. It's our last Sunday to say our April memory verse together, and so you'll look on the tab of your bulletin there. Our April memory verse, we'll say it together. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 7. So our Old Testament reading um, has a lot to do with worship. It's Psalm 22, at the, latter, the very end of Psalm 22, uh, and it can be found in the Pew Bible uh, on page 540. And I invite you to read along with 509. Psalm no, I'm sorry. Yeah, Did y'all hear that? I was right. <laughs> You're in Job. Well, we can do that. You want to? Okay. So, so, 
Okay, so Psalm uh, 22, starting at verse 25. From you, O Lord, comes my praise in the great congregation. My, my vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him, shall bow down all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Bless the reading of this word. Our next hymn this morning, you will find on page 393, Breathe on me, breath of God, if you will please stand with me once again. <clears throat> Testament lesson for today uh, can be found in the Pew Hymnal, perhaps on page 1212. And, uh, huh? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I feel better. Okay, so uh, this is 1 John 4, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 7 and go to verse 21. Read with me if you will. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify 
that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Bless the reading of God's holy word. Thank you, Roger. Powerful, powerful words from the disciple that Jesus loved. As we come to our prayer time this morning, let me just remind you of a couple of Folks, uh, I would ask you to uh, continue to pray for Ellen Kofer Stansel's family. That service for Shay's uh, mother was yesterday, I believe, uh, up near Blue Ridge. And uh, we want to continue to pray for them. Mike and Barbara are there with their family uh, this morning. Uh, particularly pray for uh, Mary Payton, who is often a visitor here, a sweet and wonderful young lady, and we want to hold her up uh, as well as the rest of the family. Also, uh, I added last week but failed to mention uh, prayers for Sherry Cones, former council uh, woman here in Louisville who is battling some intense uh, health issues. We want to pray uh, for her in these days. And I would ask you to continue to pray for uh, Susan Dowdy uh, with the loss of Jerry so unexpectedly. Um, certainly there are a number of um, things that we need to be lifting up uh, concerning all that, but pray for Susan. Pray for the peace that comes only through Jesus Christ and that she would sense the presence of the Lord uh, in her everyday life. Uh, life. Others here that certainly need our prayer, I was just talking with uh, Suzanne Jones about uh, Joanne and Clark Evans, we want to be praying for them, and others here that need uh, your watch care over them uh, in the days ahead. Let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Father God, as we come this morning, we are mindful that you are a great and mighty God, one who is able to do even more abundantly than we can imagine or dream. And so, O oh Father, we lift these uh, folks on our prayer list and others who are on our hearts before you this day, asking that you would uh, meet the specific needs that each one has. Lord, there are people who need your strength, or your healing, your encouragement, um, that need from a human standpoint a miracle, O oh Lord, and yet you hold each one in your hand. Nothing is a surprise to you. And so, Father, we're thankful that we can worship and pray to a God who is alive and well and working for our good and for your glory. Father, we would pray that you would uh, be with those who are traveling. Uh, we have a number of folks on the road this week. and We would ask that you would provide traveling mercies for them. Thankful for each one who is here this morning, Lord, that you would speak to them through uh, our worship service, that the power of the Holy Spirit would be proclaimed in their hearts and in their minds. 
Father, we do pray for our church that you would continue to bless it. We're thankful for uh, the many opportunities that you provide to us to spread the gospel news. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, we would follow that leading. We would even now pray for uh, our upcoming 150th anniversary celebrations, uh, but even more importantly before then for our prayer walk where we will pray in our neighborhood for those who live around us. May we be a church that reflects where we have been planted. And we would ask, O oh Lord, for the humble spirit to do that. Lord, we certainly are praying that we would be a light in our community uh, through this work here. Uh, we pray for uh, this month together for our men's community Bible study, one that has uh, been able to reach so many men to teach them the, the, the power of salvation, uh, to get them comfortable in your word. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue to grow that, uh, that you would make that an effective time of learning and fellowship. Uh, and we would pray that you would bless all those who make that happen uh, each and every week. Lord, wash us in the blood of Christ anew this day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So our ushers uh, come forward. Uh, we are so blessed, and we would pray that we would be blessed with generous hearts. thankful for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. And Lord, we would pray that you would remind us all that we give not to this church, but we give to the kingdom of God. And we thank you for each gift here. And Father, we pray that you would use them for the furtherance of that great kingdom here and around the world, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated.
I was uh, remiss in uh, not mentioning that we need to pray for Jennifer, who is under the weather. Um, so thankful for Rosie and for Greg, who steps in flawlessly to take on additional duties. And so I'm thankful to both of y'all for the beauty of our music program and thankful for Jennifer, even though she's not here this morning. You'll be turning in your Bibles to Galatians. Uh, we're going to continue here in this uh, first chapter uh, this morning. Again, more of Paul's defense. Again, he is setting up the whole first chapter for the most part is about the gospel, the purity of the gospel that he has taught and defending his own calling. So let's stand as we do each week in honor of God's Word. For we believe and we teach that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, our only rule of faith and practice. And hear the words of the Lord uh, written for us even today. For I would have you know, brothers, or I must start at verse 10, I'm sorry. For I am now... For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and then returned again. To Damascus. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this, your word. For we ask it that we would see no one but Christ alone. In his name, amen. Be seated. If you are an attender to our Sunday night Bible study, uh, you know this for a fact. If you haven't been, please come and join us 5.30 on Sunday evening. It's a great time of learning and fellowship. But there we have been in Sam the books of, uh, of Samuel, 1 Samuel, and um, uh, in Chronicles, and we're just about to move into David's reign, but we've come through the history of um, the Israelites from the time of the very beginning until uh, the time of the kings. And often we say this amongst ourselves on Sunday night. We'll say, how in the world were these people so blind? We'll say, look, they saw so many miracles. How could they forsake God and fall into idolatry so quickly? I mean, can you imagine God parting the sea, showing up in a cloud of fire or a cloud by day, 
driving out enemies before them, feeding them, their clothes didn't wear out, water comes out of rocks. They see all of this, and yet they fall into the sin of idolatry over and over and over again. How? How could they be so, one of our favorite expressions, stiff-necked, right? And then we all remember that we're just about as stiff-necked as these people. That we have the Holy Spirit actually living in us and we fall into idolatry. We have the entire Word of God as our lamp and as our guide, and yet, just like the Israelites, we pursue idols in our own heart. We manufacture things to worship more than God. We get concerned about money or jobs or this or that, or we even make up stuff to be worried and concerned in worship rather than God. And that's what has happened here in Galatia. These new Christians have been infiltrated by, by a group of false teachers. We call them Judaizers. And they've come into these young churches and perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ by teaching these young and inexperienced believers that to become saved, you have to believe in Jesus and something else. As Paul has said it here, the traditions of their fathers. They wanted people to certainly believe in Jesus, but to really become saved, to become a Christian, you had to believe in Jesus, and then you also had to follow the law of Moses, you had to keep all the dietary laws. You had to become circumcised. You had to do all these other things in addition to faith. Now, the gospel that Paul had preached was that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone, period. This New gospel that they had been teaching the people, Paul says, is really no gospel at all. You see, any time we add anything to the finished work of Jesus Christ, even our own cooperation with the gospel, we have moved it from grace to a works faith. Paul as Derek Thomas so beautifully says in his commentary on Galatians, Paul's about to take the gloves off. He's about to throw down with these Judaizers to show them that not only have they perverted the gospel, to show these Galatian Christians that the gospel that they heard him preach originally is the true gospel, and if even an angel shows up and says something different, they're not to believe it. And he has called down curses from God Almighty on anybody who would pervert the purity of the gospel. Then we come to verse 10. And it is of I think particular interest to us today. Paul says this, For am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Pleasing man or pleasing God? That's the question. It is the seductive trap of our culture today. 
Paul says, look, I am not here to make you happy. I'm here to tell you what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. I am not here to make you feel better about yourself. I'm here to make you see the need that you have. He says, look, I am called by God himself and I will do everything I can to please God and let the chips fall where they may. That makes me unpopular, so be it, Paul says. I am not here to please the culture. For us today, it is so easy to fall into this seductive trap, isn't it? To try to be pleasers. To try to fit in. Oh, we can come and be here and worship on Sunday morning and, and, and all fall into the camp, or at least most of us fall into the camp of, of wanting to please God, but it's, it's at 12 o'clock till next Sunday at 11 o'clock that we so often fall into the trap of trying to please man and not God. The culture invades at noon on Sunday for many of us. And we revert to being man pleasers. Often only because it's easier or it's simpler or it makes us more likable. How do you handle bad jokes? How do you handle gossip? How do you handle criticism? How do you handle honesty? How do you handle commitments? How do you handle boundaries when outside the magic hour of 11 to 12 on Sunday morning? As a pastor, I am called here to preach the entire counsel of God. I am not here to pick and choose easy passages. Roger and I didn't talk about what he said this morning at all, but I thought it was fascinating that the Lord laid that on his heart, right? We don't flip Sunday to Sunday to page to page to find a topic that tickles everyone's ear. We preach systematically through each book so that we get to the whole counsel of God. We don't pick passages that are unoffensive or that simply are here to make you feel better about yourself. My dear friends, how far do you just go along to get along. Paul's not doing that here. Paul is saying, look, I'm going to take the gloves off and I'm going to go to battle for the pure gospel. And if that makes me unpopular, fine. And if that makes me popular, fine. It doesn't matter. I'm here to please God and to do what God has called me to do, not what the Galatians think that he should be doing. Maybe another way to put it is, how far are you willing to compromise your faith or your theology to be popular? How much are you willing to transgress what God has called you to do? Paul ends with these words, if I'm if I'm trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. That is not only the call of the pastor, it's the call of you as well. Are you trying to please man, and that could be please even yourself, or are you trying to please God? Because let me tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, God will tell, call you, to some pretty uncomfortable places. 
Being a Christian means that you're a servant, a servant of Christ. It means you die to your own wants, your own desires, your own needs so that you might live to Him, that you set your selfish personal desires aside so that you can live the life that Christ has called you to live. But Paul goes on in verses 11 and 12. He goes on to say again that the gospel that he has preached to them already, that they heard, that they were saved by, is that grace, is that gospel of grace, not of works. It is good news not given to him by other men, but revealed to him by Jesus Christ himself. The true gospel is always God's gospel. I can't help but think that the churches that most faithfully proclaim the word of God are often the smallest churches. In verses 13 and 14, Paul talks about the fact that in his former life, if you recall from the early part of Acts, in his former life, he persecuted God and persecuted the church such that he wanted to kill off the church. He wanted to arrest Christians. He wanted to simply haul them off the street to jail. And he goes on to say here and in other places, what an outstanding Jew he really was. He knew his stuff. He was smart and hardworking. He was by far the most zealous Jew we read about in the New Testament. He was far advanced in Judaism according to others his own age. He was advancing rapidly up the ladder, so to speak, of the hierarchy of Judaism and the traditions of man. Until, until on that Damascus road, Christ changed his life forever. He says, look, that was his former life, but it transitioned in a heartbeat on that road to Damascus where Jesus appears to him and by the power of the Holy Spirit, converts him to the apostle for the Gentiles. And notice how Paul brings in here the sovereignty of God in his conversion. He says that when he who set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, at one moment in time he was pleased to reveal his son to me. In other words, his whole life of Judaism, of training, of persecution was brought, is what brought him to the point, all used by God to bring him to the point where he could become the apostle to the Gentiles. God was using even his sinful actions for his ultimate glory and for Paul's good. Now, Paul's conversion is dramatic and radical. We all remember the story, I hope, of the blinding light and the voice that comes that knocks him off the horse and Jesus says, Paul, Paul, or Saul, Saul, at that point, why do you persecute me? Now, I think it's important for me to say at this point that not every conversion 
looks like a Pauline conversion. Let me put it like this. Every conversion is different, and every conversion is the same. Now, what do I mean by that? Every conversion is different. Richard Baxter, the great Puritan preacher, said, God does not break all hearts alike. Perhaps you're sitting here today and you can relate to Paul's dramatic conversion when God just knocked your feet out from under you and brought you into saving faith with him and changed you. Perhaps you can point to the day or even to the <clears throat> exact hour you were saved. Others here would probably say that I don't remember, Bill, a time when I didn't believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I know there was a time when I was not saved, but I can't remember it. Jesus has always been a part of my life. And so conversions for each one of us here are different, and yet they are all alike. And what I mean by that is while each heart might be broken differently, the same thing happens in every heart. Your heart of stone is changed to a heart of flesh. The Holy Spirit comes and changes what you do and what you want to do. He breathes into you new life. That is the heart of the gospel. So while everyone is different, there is a consistently consistence in every conversion that it requires repentance and faith. These are the twin wings that result in a new heart. Well, finally, Paul goes on and says that when Christ revealed to him the gospel of grace and faith. He didn't go to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles there or other leaders. He didn't consult with anyone else. He didn't go to Peter and say, look, is this right? No, he's sitting under the very tutorial of Jesus Christ himself. And he says, oh, look, I didn't go to Jerusalem. I went to Arabia. Exactly where he went and where he spent those three years of his, what I would call seminary training, we don't know. We just know that he ended up uh, with his Old Testament and with the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, learning what the gospel was all about. And so Paul was perhaps one of the most unlikely people to ever become an apostle, a leader, a teacher in the church of Jesus Christ. And yet nothing is impossible without, with, uh, with God, right? So I would ask you this morning as we close, God has called you just like he's called Paul. He's called you to a different calling, but he has nonetheless called you. He's called you to faith before you were born. He ordained the steps of your life, the purpose for you in his church. So let me ask this question. What is your purpose here in Louisville ARP Church? I realize some of you are not members, but it doesn't mean you don't have a purpose here. What is your purpose here? How are you building up and strengthening God's church and work here? How are you contributing to the furtherance of the kingdom of God in this place? You have been called here for that purpose. 
And I would simply ask, are you fulfilling that purpose? Are you participating in building up the church? All of you have talents. All of you have treasure. All of you have time. How are you employing it for the betterment of God's kingdom here? Because he has called you to be a member here or to visit here or to worship here. How are you contributing? How are you building up? How are you volunteering? Paul, Paul understood that before he was even born, God called him to a purpose in his church and I would say the same is true for everyone here today. You have a purpose here in building up the church. Paul would remind us of this. That we are to die to self that we might live for the furtherance of God's kingdom. Amen. Oh, Lord, thank you for the richness of your mercy to us. Give us all a sense of that purpose, a sense of that calling, Lord. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will stand with me for our last hymn on page 510, Heaven Came Down. We will do first and third verse, please. Now the benediction, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.